there are two two sorts of movements which have now emerged as uh, or they pose certain kind of challenges to women's movements i would say uh, one uh, the rise of uh, dalit movement certainly uh, the increasingly assertive uh, dalit movement the rise of dalit fem feminists and dalit feminist voices becoming increasingly important Mm, and uh, the second of course comes from you know the uh, looking at sexuality in much broader terms that that is the rise of uh, voices of lgbtq movements which are increasingly again becoming very vocal and assertive and important they they are a minority but they are an increasingly very vocal minority and they pose very important challenges for the uh, women's movement or the, or the way in which uh, um, women's movements were conceived of practiced by activists in in the past okay uh, uh, the third thing which comes in you know just to give you a c example of the current me too campaign and all that uh, what happened and how a certain group of feminists were actually uh, criticized so vocally by by a younger more um, more aggressive dare i say you know they i i don't know whether to call them feminists but there there were a whole lot of other people who claimed to be dalits who came to be queer and claimed all sorts of other identities and appropriated them and saw these feminists as speaking up for savarna and uh, you know upper class upper caste uh, men in many ways so uh, these have become very Uh, difficult and complex questions now so now uh, what you dealt with was a uh, was complex enough but you know there were there were there are these new challenges which have emerged so how would you suppose you were to sort of write this or, or do this now in the current scenario how would you go about it how would you sort of uh, incorporate all these uh, you know multiple voices and arguments and debates that are that are going on now see that's an, an excellent question um pragati and i feel that you know this was a book written in pre shabano mm. hmm? this was a book which was pre mandal and those were the two really explosive moments when you know many the, the picture of caste the the question of religious difference you know came up in a completely different way so but but i do think that the question of you know that the more identitarian questions were you know not so central to the 80s when we were writing so when you look at you know this book you notice that caste appears a lot mm. but caste still appears as i think a relatively static category in the essays uh perhaps even in our own understanding it doesn't appear you know though we were very concerned with the reformulation of patriarchies and of class and the agrarian economy and then the political economy as a whole i don't think we attended as carefully to the constant you know restructuring of caste itself and that definitely is a gap in the book which later historians have fulfilled have marvelously so you know i don't think this book could have done everything but it did open the doors you yeah, know for for these certainly. questions uh now i think what's also happened is that with identitarian politics you know where you have both very severe caste repression and caste assertions happening uh where you have dalit women's groups muslim women's groups you know which have come into their own uh there i think another retrospective view of history is in order and i think it's happening not in the covers of a single anthology but i think there is as you know so much very interesting work happening now on questions of caste and religious difference historically that um in some way it does you know and and very attentive to the current equally i think there is now work on going beyond heteronormativity mm. normativity historically right and since this was a book which wanted to deepen the idea of the past in order to fight the simplifications and paranoias of the present you know mm. so i think that kind of work is continuing 
I, I think if one were to now redo uh, or, or to rethink of this in, in some other way, it's very, very because there's, there's a fourth thing you haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. not just caste heteronormativity, mm -hmm. and, but also the neoliberal economy. Yes. Of you know, this was again a pre neoliberal economy book. Mm -hmm. So, what Isn't we're looking 89? at is the idea of development. That is this, you know. And when we are saying women are left out of the production pr process and then looking at that historically. But then, you know, how does one, you know, think about the kind of historiography that would be needed to ballast a neoliberal economy? It's a huge question. Uh, and I think also we've seen another major shift, which, you know, which, which also needs to be mentioned, is the changing character of the state and the market. You know, dowry had come in. But we hadn't gone into a, a patriarchal market regime. The patriarchal market regime really stepped up in the, from the 1990s. So what we now have is a triangular contest uh, between a patriarchal familial regime, a patriarchal state regime, and a patriarchal market regime. And that is something in which not only is feminism trapped, but also that which feminism is struggling against. Right. So I think that that, you know, that, you know, and, and, and then questions of agency, which was so important to us at the time, consent and agency. Huh? I mean, now uh, the market has appropriated the discourse of agency. Uh, consent has, you know, so many different aspects to it, which include even uh, communal violence, hmm? where communities will tighten in the face of communal violence, as we are seeing now in even the triple talaq you know, Bill. So I think it's a different field now. And I think to, to address that field in the here and now, I can see how to do it. In fact, I wrote a book on this market state and familial regime called yeah. solid liquid yeah. and so on. But how to address it historically, I think is a challenge which we must, uh, you know, try and, and face. You know, is this now going to be something which is going to just talk about the problems of capitalism and how it developed? Could, you know, is there, are, are there any foreseeable precedents historically? I think not. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that alignment between, you know, historical work and the present, you know, will need a lot more innovation. Uh, I mean, when I uh, read it more recently, because you know you had, uh, we were going to have this conversation. I'm, I'm amazed uh, still at the range of subjects and issues that this book still manages to uh, capture between its covers. Many of these articles continue to be relevant. I mean, I just, uh, I said uh, that things have changed and we need to address them in different ways, certainly. But there are certain uh, uh, part, certain elements of this the, this book and uh, certain parts of the scholarship inherent in it is still very relevant and is still widely read and uh, you know really uh, practiced. I would say that it sort of entered academic practice certainly, and that is uh, something you know the longevity of this book is therefore uh, really creditable. I I don't know what else to say. The uh, the second thing I just wanted to say is that uh, there are the, the other thing I remember from the which I tried. To, this was a hugely influential book for for my generation of uh, you know scholars and historians. Is the uh, this phrase that how to relate the ideological to the experiential? You know this is. Uh, from somewhere in the in introduction. the introduction, I remember this, and that has always been a very, uh, very, very important and uh, to me a very, very original idea at that point, the, because uh, much of the history writing that we we read, uh, we studied, and we practiced seemed actually uh, beyond our experience or somehow not related to a very vaguely related to our world. And this is, in this way, this book actually 
it meant a great deal to practitioners of history and practitioners of feminist history by sort of re redefining almost uh, what femini practice of feminist history is going is is like it it sort of showed uh, us the way to do do our research in some ways to find find precisely these relations between ideological and experiential so uh, in in terms of uh, which are your sort of more you, you didn't apart from the uh, introduction you did not write a piece for this uh, this volume uh, neither you nor sudesh actually wrote for it so so which are the essays that you find you found more uh, relatable or more interesting or which are your favorites may i ask you this well let me go back to the beginning of your question i mean one is yes that it's been um of your observations rather it has been read not just by uh, gender studies and history but it's a widely used book in cultural studies cultural of course and it is strangely enough not restricted to india mm -hmm. it's had an enormous international circulation and it was republished abroad and is now online and all kinds of things like that and and i find you know people reading it in english departments and all kinds yeah, yeah. of sociology yeah, whatever uh you know the question of ideology and experience is absolutely crucial because you know where do you draw the line between the two and at some level as we know the experiential has been a legitimating device for all feminist activism we can't do without that category and the reason why it comes to be called experience and becomes a legitimating device is because of the sheer repetition of patriarchal oppressions if violence didn't happen again and again and again and again it would not acquire become the category experience right but then experience is always mediated it's always interpreted hmm? and where the ideology you know leaks in and again you know one has to resist the idea of ideology as some totally determining structure you know because then you just get some kind of closed you know and fatalistic universe and so it's actually contradictions which become central in both categories you know within the experience and within the ideology where they come together where they diverge and i think it still remains an under examined field you know in many i think the one could go so much further on this path um as as to the you know we were very closely involved in the writing of these essays in fact i translated much of veer bharat talwar and stuff we didn't acknowledge because it seemed like you know a little self aggrandizing we didn't uh, put in our own work because there was no space for it we could have put in two things which we left out one was our sudesh and my joint work on widow immolation mm. uh and then the other was the work that i had done by that time on mirabai and gandhi mm. but we left them all out and we thought no it has to have a coherence let's not jump back into the medieval let's not jump forward into the contemporary you know let it have its period as it were as far as possible so we didn't do that then we were very closely involved by inland letters to those of our contributors who were not in town you know every you know we every essay, essay was edited like three times by us and it would go to them and then they would say yes to the corrections it would come back it would go back it would come back it took 3 years it didn't come out of a conference it was an entirely commission book so the question of favorites is very hard to you know answer and i think it would be unfair because what i have found is that different people have picked up different essays in the book and you know not every essay speaks to everybody but but i don't think there's any essay which has not spoken you know at some point or the other or or to or to to certain readerships uh and and then again there were some things in the essays we didn't agree with you know this always happens some essays which uh, we learned from and so on so you know it was all whatever and then because we were not pushing a line mm. you know we had a very strong idea of what our perspective was as you can see in the introduction 
uh, of directionality, but we didn't want to propagate a line. We did feel that this, you know, even consciously that we were opening things up. We didn't want to put, you know, a closure. So in that sense, I think that, that, that you know, that that book works as a coherent whole, but there are enormous differences inside it too. As I look back on our conversation, one is the enormous growth of the informal service sector and what that is doing, you know, yeah, with... Very large numbers of women yes, in it. Yes, yes. So the whole question of political economy, labor, you know, has yeah, again... Yeah, Nirmala Banerjee's essay could be now rewritten in a... In, with a whole right, set of different right. materials. And one and might go back then to looking at things which we didn't do there, like indentured labor, labor. bonded labor. You know, so I think that labor question, you know, now, by hindsight, looks much bigger, even much bigger than, you know, what we attempted here. And the other thing I want to, to, to say is what is different now is the level of anti-feminism. You know, I think people call it backlash, but I'm not inclined to use the term backlash. I think there were virulent pockets of anti-feminism even in the 1980s. I know, for instance, when we were doing a field work in Rajasthan on widow immolation and stuff, you know, we came across it in many, many venues. But these were pockets. Now it has a kind of national presence. And I think that once feminism becomes a political alternative, it's actually the success of feminism. Once it becomes a political alternative, then the violence and repression that is inherent in patriarchal practices you know, becomes a public anti-feminism. And I think that is something that, uh, you know, we didn't encounter in this intensity, depth and spread at the time. Because had we done so, we would have looked so much more seriously and historically at misogyny. Yes, uh, yes, I was, I was just yeah. going to say that, that there is a, and now I think uh, work needs to be done in the, uh, in this area, the history of misogyny really in, in all our, you know, texts, films and cultural traditions and all sorts of things. So thank you, Kumkum, for thanks, Pragati. It's and, lovely. Okay. It brings back our old college days. Yes, and thank you for watching. <laughs>